Everyone, hit the bell and subscribe and share this video. Yo, yo, my people, it's your boy Ebi the Kid. Welcome to another episode of The Kid Show. Obviously, today we have a very, very special guest. When I started this podcast, initially it was for influencers, musicians, and um, a lot of young people. But I feel like we've been given the opportunity to give the young people. I, I think you, I think you're kind of young, Mister Mayor. I was about to say, like you are young, I, but I, I, I'm still young. But I feel like you're very. I'm not, I'm not uh, Gen Z. Uh, you have a very mature yeah. perspective on life, though. <laughs> okay. And obviously, I'm running the city. Good save. So today, yeah. <laughs> today we got the mayor, Mr. Jordan Hill Lewis. First and foremost, yeah, sir, how are you? I'm very well. Nice to be with you, Evie. I'm very good. Thank you so much, brother. It's an honor. My um, honor as well. Are you, are you honored to be on my show? Absolutely. I've heard a lot about how incredibly well you've done on the show. Uh-huh. You've grown it from nothing. So congrats, man. Thank you so much. Yo, I never <laughs> thought in my life that I'll be sitting with a man and telling me about my show. But that's nuts. Uh, initially, I want to ask you first and foremost about your upbringing. Yes. Um, I know that you went to Edgemouth High School. I did. And yeah. primary school. Primary school. I went to JJ Maiden. Ah, down yeah. the road. We used to play rugby against you guys. Were you, were you any good? Did you guys have any no, luck against he beat us? us. Yeah. JJ's very good at rugby. Yeah, we're very great. But yeah. a lot of people always have bad things to say about my high school. But I want to ask you, like. I think you've got a great high school. I had a very good. My, my, actually, my very best friend. Uh-huh. Uh, when did you matriculate? About 2018. So you, did you know Mr. Erasmus? Yeah, Mr. Erasmus. Yeah, he yeah. was. He, he moved to um, Weinberg High School. Yes. Yeah, exactly. he, was, he was great. That's my best mate. Ah, that's. Yeah. How old are you, sir? Uh, I'm 36. Wow. Yeah. Right. He's the he's one year older. Ah, interesting. So So how's it going, Joel? EB knows you. Yeah. <laughs> Where is he now though? Is he still on um uh he's in Bloom, but he might be coming back soon. We're uh, we're working on it. A uh, very, very good rugby coach, yeah. no? Excellent. Do you want him a part of your team or oh, <laughs> he was he yeah, we played together. We played together rugby. In, in high school, yeah. Oh. Yeah. He was very good and he, and a great coach. So where did you grow up and did you grow up in the in Edgemid? Because I know you so, came from Plate initially. Yeah, and so, then, but I moved to Cape Town very young. Uh, I was I had some lung problems when I was when I was a kid, so I spent a lot of time in Cape Town. Needed a drier climate, but then also my parents were split, splitting up, so we moved here to Cape Town when I was uh, like three or four, very young. Then I've lived here ever since. I'm basically Cape Townian, uh-huh. and grew up in Edgemead, uh, which is in the north of the city, close to JG. Yeah. And uh, my mom was a single mom, obviously. She 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 is a nurse, still uh, a nurse. My mom's a nurse too. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, cool. And uh, uh, so th- that was really my upbringing. Uh, a little bit later in life, when I was in high school, my mom went to work abroad. And uh, so I had uh, an awesome opportunity to live with my dad at that point uh, and so went to primary school and high school in Edgemead uh, then went to varsity here at UCT mm-hmm. and uh, and got involved in politics through it all mm, so you never you never um, had the love for politics during school or did you pick it up after, after no, school? in school already in school. so how are you how are you engaging like for someone who's in high school right now how can they get involved in politics already from a young age so they have the right foundation I think you just got to start reading about politics, or not. You, you don't even have to read books. I know that that uh, you know podcasts are hugely popular. Yeah. Uh, YouTube channels. So just start learning about what's going on in society, what's going on in the world around you. Mm-hmm. That's how I got interested. Uh, you know, mainly in the early two thousands when I was in high school, through uh, reading about what was going on in South Africa, what South Africa's history was, yeah. political history was, and just became extremely fascinated by that. Uh, by all of those stories and by a kind of awareness that this is, in one way, a very dysfunctional society that yeah. we have, and in many ways a very fascinating society, and mm-hmm. where you can really make a difference. One one person, one dedicated person, working hard, doing the right thing, living with integrity, you can actually make a difference in in South Africa. No, that's very very interesting because I've seen like how how effective you've been within handling problems, like for instance with the floods. Like it was done in like less than a day. Mm-hmm. And normally you might say with that problem for a bit longer. So I want to ask you like, obviously Plate is a different city to um, <laughs> to Cape Town. So how was the, I mean, you didn't have much transition, but do you have any any memories of staying in Plate? Not not at all. Not I've, at all. Look, I've been back there many times. Obviously it's a, be- now it's a beautiful holiday town mm-hmm. and it's and it's huge. It's it's just bloomed. Mm-hmm. From what I understand from, from my parents, when we were there, it was a kind of, tiny little uh, village nothing like it is today uh, so but I have absolutely no memory of plets at at all I'm afraid I, I left uh, uh, too young have you been to the plate rage 
<laughs> no, definitely yeah. not. Why not? My parents would never. <laughs> oh, your parents would never allow your parents strict when you were growing up. Absolutely, very, very, very. You know, I, I grew up in a good Christian home, uh, church going. So, uh, no, plet rage would have been unthinkable. Mm. We went to Amanus. We went to camp in Amanus. Ah, I see. After, I see. Did you go to plet rage? Nah, I've never been. I've, what did like, you do after matric? After matric, initially for me, I wanted to go study journalism. But no, but for for what I mean. Oh, for, for fun. Trick, for for the rage weekend. Oh, for, for the rage weekend. No, I I just went home. Me and my <laughs> friends weren't really exciting. I thought you, I thought you were asking about my life and what I was doing. <laughs> no, we'll get to that now. But but no no for for rage weekend I went camping in a monastery. Ah, that's interesting. So you you mentioned about podcasts and how getting into podcasts and watching podcasts yeah. are like a good way to learn about politics. Yes. But at the same time, we also have podcasts that tend to use propaganda to sway votes. Votes. So, how do you differentiate between yeah. the right and the wrong podcast? Sure, that's a great question. There is so much very bad information and misinformation out there, and some of the stuff that I've seen on on YouTube and and Facebook is just appallingly mm -hmm. uh, misleading. So, you've got to be careful about what information you accept as fact, yeah, uh, and try to check it and double check it and and, and cross check it. And uh, you know, try to read various sources. Don't don't find one source of information mm -hmm. and accept everything that person or that company says as as gospel truth. Yeah. Try to get various sources of information and balance that which sounds so preposterous that you need to check it out. Then go and check it first. Uh, but this is one of the key challenges for for people growing up today is is actually how to sift fake information. Yeah. Because there is just an endless ton of it out there, uh, particularly on social media. So it's a great question that you ask. I, I don't have an easy answer, except perhaps uh, to don't accept any one source. Check check your sources. Check your sources. Yeah. At, the, at, at the same time, like I feel like um, in order for people to understand, because there's a lot of young young kids, like young men, young women, yeah. who are very um, impressionable. So can you please like maybe lay down a few negatives of following the wrong podcast and like just using that in your normal life because i feel like a lot of people are led astray like there's a lot of popular figures that have been cancelled by twitter and mm -hmm. cancelled by instagram because they are misleading the youth yeah so what are the dangers of following these wrong sources and not fact checking so there's a couple of red flags that you got to watch out for if someone is trying to get you excited on the basis of hating or disliking other people yeah that's usually a big red flag mm -hmm. If someone is trying to make you panic about something that's going on in the world or in life through some kind of, there's some imminent catastrophe that's about yeah. to hit you mm -hmm. and everyone's lying to you and there's a big uh, global conspiracy, yeah. those are all red flags that you mm -hmm. need to watch out for. And I think the most dangerous ones are are those that whip up emotions against other people, yeah. that seek to divide us against one another. Uh, ordinary Cape Tonians, ordinary South Africans, actually, the vast majority want the same thing. We want the country to work. We want better opportunities for our kids. We want a safer society. And if you have people constantly telling you everything that's going wrong, well, it's someone else's fault, and not a usually not a person, but a group of people. Yeah, it's their fault. This is the reason you don't have the life that you want. This is the reason that things are not working. Those are always big red flags for, because throughout the centuries, long before uh, podcasts, long before YouTube, that has been the mainstay, the, the consistent strategy and tactic of bad leaders through the ages it has been to whip up emotion on the basis of hate and division. So that's your biggest red flag. Okay, Stay away from that stuff. That's, that's a good one. And I feel like that's, that's very important because we need to obviously mm. protect the youth. Um, I want to understand how you went to UCT. Yeah. While you were at UCT, um, you study political science? I, I first did what's called a PPE, a Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. And then from there, you studied further? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you also established the DA student organization? Yes. How did that come about and what whopped up the idea within you? Okay. So firstly, I, my <laughs> folks couldn't afford to send me to UCT. Yeah. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get a bursary uh, to go there mm -hmm. through the Parfit Trust and uh, I'm extremely grateful for the wonderful work that the Parfit Trust does still in Cape Town today. There's many, many students. What what do they do though? What's they, 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 they 
give university bursaries and, and I, I really encourage people to check them out online and apply for one because they do amazing work and um, <clears throat> they, they were able to pay for me. So uh, I went there, I registered for a BCom. Obviously, you know, the famous story of, of growing up with this single parent, single yeah. mom. She said, you can study anything you want to as long as it's accounting, <laughs> law, uh, or medicine. Yeah. Uh, and so I had to tell her, I'm not going to do any of those three. I'm mm -hmm. going to do a PPE, a politics, philosophy, and economics, uh, which was at that stage quite a kind of out there degree. It's, it's now more mainstream. So I did that undergrad in my first year. I had, I'd already joined the DA at high school already in, mm -hmm. in matric. Uh, and had been, as I said, reading a whole lot of stuff, being very interested. Yeah. And uh, decided when I got to UCT, there was no branch there. There was no activism. I, I saw other uh, youth organizations, ANC Youth League and, and others. I didn't see any. So I decided I started myself. Yeah. And so I did in, in first year in 2005, started DASA. Yeah, it's early. It's, it's become a It's become a national organization now. It's still winning elections all over the country. Uh, representing students very well, uh, and and loved it. Ran it for the whole time that I was at Varsity. Uh, eventually built it to the point where we won our first SRC election at mm. UCT. Uh, I served on the SRC, so I had a I had a wonderful time. I learned a huge amount about politics. Then I, I probably and I, I must say this uh, just to be fully honest, neglected my studies somewhat, so I didn't get ah. as good marks as I should have. Um, but then I went on to study a bit further. I did an honors. And then I had a choice to make. Uh, do I st stick around and carry on studying and do a master's or do I go and, and, and finally earn some money? And so I really wanted to go and, uh, and start earning some money. And so I left varsity after my honors. Mm, that's the, I think that's a big conundrum, whether you should study further yeah. or whether you should, um, you should go into work and obviously start earning an income, especially with a single mother. Yeah. Your mother's probably worried about um, you just taking care of her and taking care of the family. And that. And I, had to, I had to pay rent. Oh, you had to pay rent. Oh, yeah, because I feel like that's, that's the, that's the um, common South African yeah, family. Absolutely. You have yeah. to pay rent from an early age. Yeah. Now, um, you be, now the, became the mayor, and I feel like a big part of you becoming the mayor was obviously contributed to by starting the um, student mm. organization. Mm. Yeah, now, that's true. For a 15 year old or a 16 year old, like I understand what the mayor does, but for someone who doesn't have much knowledge on what the mayor actually does, can mm. you please like okay, lay down cool. the blueprint? That's a, that's a good question. So, in the old days, mayors were ceremonial positions. Yeah. Uh, they would go around and cut ribbons and wear the gold chain and all of that kind yeah. of thing. In the new South Africa, uh, since uh, 1999, when uh, when local government was for the first time, we had our first local government elections. The mayors in South Africa are extremely important. They they are called in law executive uh, positions, and that's because they actually run the city. It's no longer a ceremonial uh, role. The mayor has got a, a huge amount of. Uh, legislated legal power in yeah. terms of the law and the uh, the city administration accounts to the mayor and the mayor exercises a huge number of decision making powers on behalf of the full city of cape town council so it's now a very responsible position uh, it comes with a huge amount of of pressure yeah. and responsibility but it is also, I think, uh, particularly in Cape Town, let me not say for the other cities because it's a bit tougher there, <laughs> I think actually the, the, it's, it might be the best job in South African politics. I, I really do mean that. Sometimes I, I still have a kind of pinch yourself moment yeah. because this is a wonderful city. It's a global city. Uh, it's known around the world. It has incredible people. And, uh, and you know, I get the, the opportunity to, to lead the city. So it's... It's 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 a huge privilege. Oh, interesting. Uh, I also adopted this, this idea of thinking my vote doesn't matter. So obviously the twenty twenty four elections is fast approaching. Mm. Uh, what advice can you give to the youth to encourage them to vote? Because me myself, I think okay, it's just one vote. It's not really going to matter. Yeah. So what advice could you give to us? Okay. So firstly, it's it's really important. That, thank you for being honest. That, yeah. That's the the attitude that you've adopted. Mm -hmm. But it is. Let me try to persuade you to, to yeah. have a different uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, every every decision that we make about the future is made politically. It's made by people who are elected representatives. 
And these, these things have profound consequences for our country. The reason that we don't have enough electricity, the reason that our economy is not growing fast enough to provide jobs for young people, these are all fundamentally flowing from poor political and policy choices that have been made over the years. Yeah. And those choices are made by people who are elected to make them. Mm -hmm. So every single vote is important. Every single vote is important. And it's important that you think about your vote, that you don't just commit it to the same party that your parents have always voted yeah. for or the same party that everyone around you in your neighborhood votes for. Don't think like that. Think, make your own decision. F look at what's in your interest as a voter for the future of your family. Yeah. Uh, and and what do you, th you know, who who on offer of all of the offers is going to make the best decision or the best uh, policies for for your future and the future of your family, and then decide your vote like that. Uh, and it is really, really, really important that when people sit out of the vote, it's not going to change anything for the better. If anything, it is going to change things, but for the worse. For the worse, yes. Because there's still going to be a group of people there. They're mm -hmm. still going to be making decisions. Mm -hmm. They're just going to be making them without thinking of you because you're not, you're not participating in the process. Yeah. And if you look at our politics in South Africa, how old it is, uh, and I'm very proud to be one of the youngest mayors in the country, uh, and I think we need many more young South Africans to get into politics and, and get involved, not just by voting, but actually putting up their hand and saying, I want to be active mm -hmm. um we can actually start to change the the demographic of people who are making decisions in our country yes because just like in america where every one of the candidates seems to be over the age of 80 look at look at the average age of cabinet ministers in south africa look at the average age of presidents in south africa over the last two decades look at the average age of members of parliament mm -hmm. The, I was a member of parliament. I think I was one of only nine members of parliament under the age of uh, 40. Nine in our whole parliament. Oh, and I, I, We've got I, 400, by the way. Yeah, I, I credit that to, to the same idea of my vote doesn't matter. I feel like that same concept yeah. is the same concept that you all adopted because I can guarantee you there's a lot of, a lot of youth watch my show. Mm. So when they see a political figure on the show, they're all going to think negative. Yeah. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why a lot of the youth are scared to step into politics and step into making a change for the country because they're scared of the negative backlash that they might receive. Yeah. So I have you dealt to that. And what advice could you give to people to un make them understand not, not all politicians are bad because I feel like <laughs> we are we are, we are are fed this idea of, oh, they steal, yeah. they take. So, and not without good cause. Yeah. If you look at what the, the performance of the average politician in mm -hmm. South Africa, it's pretty poor. Yeah. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, yes, it's true. South Africa has far too many politicians who are in it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. But that is not a reason to to step away, yeah. pull back. That is actually a reason to get involved mm -hmm. because we need more people and more young people, again, who are in it for the right reason, who are in it for the future of our country, uh, for the, the future of, of our children. Even if you don't have children now, I now... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm old enough that I have a, a daughter of my own. Yes. But soon you will be there mm -hmm. uh, in the next few years. And and it's important to get involved now to secure their future yes. as well. So that's what it's about for me. That's why I do what I do. Uh, I, feel, I feel a deep sense of purpose in doing this. There's lots of other fun things that I could do. There's there's you know there's there's lots of other things uh, where you can make a positive difference. So I'm yeah. not saying this is the only one, mm -hmm. but it is a very important one to 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 uh, make a positive contribution to the future of all of our country and for those uh, South Africans who are not even born yet, but uh, but who are coming soon. At at the same time, um, like I said about not not wanting to vote, do you feel like changing mindsets now and Voting now and building, building, building could sway the entire like the could sway the right people people into um into power in South Africa, because I feel like it's a it's a process yeah. it's not going to happen overnight. So if we keep stepping away, yeah, we're never going to have the opportunity to sway the power within the country. Exactly. What we need is more young people. Uh, what we need is better quality people who yes. are who are generally uh you know have have invested in uh, their own education who have got skills who understand what's really happening mm -hmm. in in south africa in communities 
those are the kind of people that we need to put up their hands and say, I'm prepared to go into public service, into politics. Again, that's not the only place. Yeah. Maybe understand me. If you if you become a, a great teacher or, or a high school headmaster or primary school, whatever, that is an awesome contribution. Mm -hmm. If you become a doctor, in a, in a, that is an amazing contribution. Yes. But it's also important that we don't leave the business of governing to the worst kind of people that are only interested in mm -hmm. it for themselves. Yeah. Uh, because that's what we have in South Africa. Uh, so there's, there's, there's just too few good, connected, in touch, on the ground, skilled, ambitious young people in politics today uh, who are not in it just for what they can get out of it, but for what they can put into it for the future. Uh, so, so, you know, big encouragement from, from my side, please, to get involved. And, and it starts with just, you know, like, are you registered to vote? Yeah. Do you know where you're supposed to vote on election day? Please make sure that you do actually go and use that basic power, uh, which, which has been hard fought for. Yeah, at the same time, for people who are wondering, like, if they don't want to become politicians, maybe they could become a teacher that could persuade kids to vote. Absolutely. Because the main problem we have right now is kids not voting. Yeah, I mean, oh, man, look, when I see the difference that great teachers make in yes. our country, uh, the, the, the difference that they made to me, part of the reason that I got so interested in what was happening in South Africa was great teachers yes. at, at, at Edgemead. Uh, you know, when I look at, when I meet young doctors who are uh, fresh out of high school, they're going to med school, now they find themselves working at a community clinic in a township somewhere in South Africa, making an incredible difference. Mm -hmm. So again, I want to underscore there's so many, even if you start a business like you have, Evie, you know, that, that is a wonderful contribution because we need more entrepreneurs, millions more entrepreneurs yeah. in our, in our uh, country to, to get people into work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's lots of other good contributions you can make uh, in our country, but just make a positive contribution. Leave this place better than when you found it. That's, that's my mission. Brilliant. Now, there's been a lot of people that haven't left this place better than they found it. And the main question on South Africans' mind, and I feel like a lot of youth as, yeah. as well, they want to watch TV, they want to be on their phones, they want their <laughs> oh, phones to be charged. Yes. So load shedding. Yeah. Can you please like break it down and explain to us how we got here? Yes. And yes. how we can get out of this? So the, 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 it's a very simple, basic explanation mm -hmm. for how we got here. The, the first job of any government anywhere in the world is to invest stuff. You know, there's a rule about sharks. If you if a shark stops swimming, it dies. Yeah. Have you heard that before? A shark has to swim constantly, mm -hmm. right? It can never stop moving. It's a little bit the same with governments. You have to always be building stuff. Yeah. If you're not building stuff, you're dying mm -hmm. quickly. And what happened from about 1994, basically from the, the turn of democracy to about 2007, was the government invested nothing in new power. Mm. But what happened when we when we became a democracy? Uh, firstly, obviously, population is growing all the time. More, yeah. more babies are being born. More people are coming. All the so population is growing up. But we had this huge economic boom after democracy. The size of the economy grew tremendously. We needed huge amounts of new power, and none was being created. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's not something that you can build in five minutes. Mm -hmm. To build enormous power stations takes years, takes a decade or more. Yeah. So then they started to do it in a rush in 2008. They built these enormous, some of the biggest coal power stations in the world mm -hmm. called Madupi and Kusile. I'm sure these are names that you've heard before. Yeah, definitely. Mainly for bad reasons because they still don't work. Yeah. <laughs> it took them a decade to build them. It cost triple what they initially were supposed to cost because yeah. there was also corruption in the meantime and mm -hmm. everyone was taking from it and blah, blah. And at the end of this day, they still didn't work. And so we had and still have load shedding mm -hmm. because we do not have enough electricity to cater for our population. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. The government did not invest. And that's why every day I talk about this word, which I know young people probably don't get excited about, called infrastructure. Yeah. But unless a city government is building roads, building wastewater treatment works, building new water plants, mm -hmm. the basic infrastructure that makes every society work, you don't know about it until you switch your tap on and nothing comes out. Yeah. Uh, then then your, your society is in trouble. So we've got to keep investing. That's why we have load shedding. And that's... that's uh, that's why it's been around for so long. I bumped into a gentleman like a few weeks ago and he told me they are currently building solar 
in yeah. in in Cape Town. So do you think that's the that's the best way out for us? I I mean I didn't I didn't know like I don't know if it's on the news because obviously as young people we don't watch the news a lot, but sure. he was one of the people that <laughs> 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 he was one of the people that was working on yeah. on the site. So uh, is that That's is that? The, I mean, I'm encouraged to hear that. We, yeah. we are building a lot of solar in Cape Town. Yeah. So Cape Town is far away from in the north of our country in Pumalanga. I'm sure you've got some viewers there. They uh, they have a lot of coal mines. We have no coal mines anywhere near Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Not for hundreds of kilometers. Yeah. So we can't build power stations. We have to build. Uh, what we have is is what God has given us. We have sun and wind. Yeah. And and we got to use it. So we are going to invest mainly in renewable power. Uh, solar and wind power uh, here in Cape Town to provide more power onto the grid to make up the difference between what ESCOM should be providing us and what they can provide us. That yeah. gap is called load shedding. And we want to make up that gap in Cape Town ourselves. We, For years we've been hoping, and I think South Africa has made this mistake, yeah. all of us, including myself, until, until uh, I, I ran for office. We've made the mistake of thinking ESCOM and the national government is eventually going to fix this. Mm -hmm. Just give them time. Yeah. Well, 16 years, 15 years later, we still know. The problem's been around for a long time. 15 years later, because when you steal all the money that's meant for building new power stations and, and the power stations are all broken, let's not get into all of that. Yeah. So we are trying to do something positive here, focus on the future, make up that gap ourselves by building uh, solar and, and wind and renewable power here in Cape Town. Do you, do you believe that we could ever go full on solar or is it not possible? I don't think it's possible to go fully uh, solar, but what we could do is slowly reduce our connection to ESCOM mm -hmm. over time. The other problem is, as uh, many of your, your viewers will know, ESCOM power is extremely expensive, yeah. very expensive. It has become very expensive over the last uh, decade. So the more that we can, and solar is very cheap, mm -hmm. very cheap. So the more that we can build our own solar and start to reduce our our reliance on ESCOM, the the more we can be a much better city. Mm. I was um, in Namibia the weekend, ah, very and nice. I found out from the Namib uh, I was in Windhoek. Okay, I was hosting at a club there, so I found out from the Namibians that we provide power to Namibia. Yeah, but we don't have power. <laughs> so I just want to understand like how that works. We do also to Botswana and Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, so, look, the the government ESCOM back in the day, I think in the nineties, yeah, um, before I was, uh, you know, I was just a, a small kid. They signed these long term contracts mm. to supply power at cheap, cheap rates. Yeah. Let me tell you, cheaper than ours, way cheaper. Yeah. So we not only are we supplying power to them, but we're supplying it at at less than half the cost that we pay ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they signed these contracts way back when, when we had excess power mm -hmm. and then we didn't build anything. And, and so now we stuck in those, uh, we stuck in those contracts. Wow. That's, that's, it's actually kind of scary because like they can't provide for our own, but they can provide for others. And it's very, it's very like, it's very alarming to say the least, but on a, on a, on a positive note, Cape Town has been able to, receive the least amount of load shedding in yes. like in in comparison to the entire south africa so yeah. how have we managed to do that well i think we we came to this realization that we're not going to wait around for escom yeah and and people have got to come to that realization whether you're living in cape town or not don't wait for escom to fix it don't wait for the police to fix mm -hmm. it don't wait for the post office to fix it mm -hmm. get on and and find a way to fix it yourself because it ain't going to be fixed by by the national government so we said we're going to we're going to fix it ourselves, and we started investing in power. As you yeah. said, you spoke to someone who's working on that. Uh, I hope it was a young person. Yeah, it was a young person. So, so you know that's that's important to us. So, as more and more power comes onto our grid, not the national grid, our grid here in the city, we can start to reduce load shedding even more. Yeah, we have this brilliant hydroelectric dam up at Gordon's Bay called mm -hmm. Stienbras, that that provides us with great power that belongs to the city it's our it's our dam and we use that to generate hydroelectric power and we feed that into the city so that we can lower load shedding so uh, uh, as our projects come online we will be able to move through the higher stages of load shedding right now today i haven't checked my app but i think we we probably giving two stages of protection today mm -hmm. who, who controls the app though 
I always wanted to know who controls the app. Sorry there's, to break your app or, or Escom to push. Escom to push, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a team here. You must have them on your show. They're fantastic guys. They they they're here in Cape Town. Uh. They built the app and and they've made it a hugely successful um, app. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I think we're probably protecting two stages today. That's yeah. what we do most days. Uh, sometimes only we can only do one stage depending on how much extra power we have. So yeah. people often ask me, one of the most common questions I get is, sometimes you you protect us two stages, why don't you always do two stages? stages? But we are always trying to do the most that we can, just depending on how much excess power that we can get into yeah. the grid. Remember, uh, part of the reason, sorry to go back to your earlier question, the reason we can't have only solar power is because it's inconsistent. Mm. The sun is not always shining. The wind is not always blowing. The, this, sometimes it's cloudy. Sometimes it's dark. Yeah. And, and so you've got to have other sources all the time. Of course. Now, you mentioned something about the National Party. And obviously, we got the, the, the city. The city and, the, and the, well, the Western Cape is a different province on its own. You mean the national government? Yeah. The gov- national government, yes. Mm. So how much power does the national government have on Cape Town? It has a lot of power. Uh, uh, South Africa is not like America, which is a is called a uh, a federal system. Yeah, where each state, what we call a province, they call a state, has a huge amount of power, mm-hmm. and the cities in those states also have a huge amount of their own power. Here, we have a lot of powers for cities and provinces, but national government is still very powerful and important. That's why we cannot fully uh, we cannot fully achieve what we would like to achieve because we still rely a lot on cooperation help support funding and so on from from the national state Mm -hmm. but where we see particular problems that we think we can do on our own like load shedding then we will go ahead and do it uh so it's a it's it's a bit of a balance oh so some some things we can control on our own and some things they have the full control over. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. I want to get into unemployment. I'm pulling out my phone because I have some statistics here for you. Okay. Uh, unemployment is a very big issue in SA and in Cape Town. The unemployment rate is 21.3% with a 45% of the population earning less than 1,200 rand yes. per month, uh, which in itself is very low. And I feel like we're always asking the question, what is the government going to do about it? But we want to know like what we as the youth can do about it. Because I've seen many of my friends go to uni for four years, study so hard, yeah. get the degrees, and they either are getting underpaid or they're not getting work at all. Or they're doing something that they never intended on doing, ending up in retail jobs, which obviously some people enjoy retail jobs, but that's not what they studied for. Yes. So yes. what can we as the youth do to combat unemployment in SA? Such a great question. Okay, a couple of, let me just build on those stats. Unemployment in Cape Town is 21%. Mm-hmm. That is way too high. But unemployment in South Africa is 36%. Mm-hmm. Okay, So we are 15 percentage points lower unemployment than the rest of the country. That's because we have an economy that is growing nicely. We have lots of tourism jobs. We have lots of uh, investment in the tourism and travel space, yeah. hospitality space. So the economy is doing quite nicely here. Over the last year, we have seen unemployment coming down very nicely in Cape mm-hmm. Town. 280,000 new jobs in Cape Town in the last year alone. Wow. Even. And mainly in hospitality. Yeah. Uh, that is really the part of the economy that is uh, that is booming. So people sometimes say to me, why do you care so much about um, tourists? You shouldn't be giving so much attention to tourists in Cape Town. Well, let me tell you, tourists in this city employ probably half a million people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is it is absolutely the Important, backbone yeah. of this of this economy. Yeah. Now, you are absolutely right that uh, that of course unemployment is still too high, even at twenty one percent. Every single thing that we do in the city is designed, thought about, focused on how do we bring that number down over yeah. time. Young people, my advice to young people would be, I I, I to- totally agree with what you what you're saying. If you get a tertiary education, you have a much better chance of getting a job. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean it will be the job that you want yeah. or the pay that you deserve, but you you have a much better chance of getting a job. Unemployment among tertiary graduates in South Africa is 7%. Oh, so it's not, it's not 7%. as high. It's way lower. Yeah. But as you say, some people are getting underpaid or they're in jobs that they don't like. Mm-hmm. So I still think the best 
uh, most important thing for the future of our country is for young people to create their own job by starting a business, as yeah. you have done. You, mm. you are, I think, a, a model, an example for, for young people in this country. Not, not everyone can have a great uh, YouTube show, but, but there's, it doesn't matter what it is. Products, businesses, manufacturing, you name it. If you've got a good idea, back yourself to do it. Yes. Back yourself to do it. And the worst that can happen is that it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll never forget this meeting that I had. I met uh, the head of a venture capital fund, one of the biggest in the world. He actually spends quite a lot of time in Cape Town. Yeah. He's got a place here. What's his name, if we may know? I've got to Google it. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Is he, um, I don't know what, if it's who I'm thinking about. Is he, is he popular on social media? Uh, no. Okay. no. No, 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 no. Okay. He's quite a quiet guy. Uh. But this guy is a major venture capitalist. And, and for those who don't know, a venture capitalist is a guy who takes big risks, investing s- relatively small amounts of money, but in lots of small companies yeah. and seeing which one blossoms. And he knows that out of every 100 investments he makes, maybe 90 are going to uh, not work out. But the one. But, but the 10 that work mm-hmm. out are going to be big. Yeah. Uh, that's what a venture capitalist does. He said something fascinating to me. Which I'll never forget. He said to me, he he gets every day he gets thousands of requests from young people wanting to meet him, obviously to pitch their business idea. Yeah. He will not even accept a meeting. He won't take a meeting with someone who hasn't had a previous business that failed. Uh, Isn't that a cool uh, lesson? That, yeah, that is a cool lesson that he only asks people who have already tried. Because he says stumbling, failing teaches you so much more than mm-hmm. any other lesson or degree or MBA or business school, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's the most important thing that, that you can learn as a small. So don't be afraid to start something and have it not work out. Uh, you know, just go for it. Uh, and then, of course, as I said earlier, I'm going to make a pitch for for the public service. If you if you feel like you you have a kind of community spirit, you want to serve, you want to give back, you want to do something helpful, come and work for the public sector. We we have got great bursaries for mm-hmm. university. And uh, and we are a very cool place to work in the city and, of Cape Town. And there's 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 uh, lots of jobs open in the in the sector. I mean, there, there's always good, very good jobs in mm-hmm. in uh, in the public sector in the city of Cape Town, whether uh, particularly for engineering. I mean, as you say, as I said earlier, we we like to build stuff. We've yeah. got to be building, and for that you need engineers, and we struggle to find engineers. Uh, so if you if you are you know good at maths and you want to study engineering, go for it. We'll we'll even help pay for it. Well, that's that's good to know that this bursary is available. For people yeah. who can't afford to study. Yeah. And you did mention how you feel like I'm a model for building a business. Yeah. And if I can give any advice to anyone out there, it's like I wanted to study journalism when I left school, but my maths wasn't great enough. I got forty nine percent for maths, not the greatest. <laughs> so I didn't get it. I could have got you to I could have got you to sixty five. Oh, would you have tutored me? Or Absolutely, I was a math tutor. That was that was how I earned extra money after school. Wow, I needed you. I needed you <laughs> back in the day. So, despite that, I think I've been able to do more than one of. Ch- w- sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but one of my uh, one of my former math pupils is going to write in the comments and tell, say how terrible I was. Uh, didn't you help him? Tutor. <laughs> anyway, yeah, tell us about your lessons. Yeah, for me, I uh, didn't didn't get into journalism, and. At the end of 2018, when I finished school, I wrote in my in my in my book, I want to have a podcast one day. But at that wow. time, I had no knowledge about podcasts. I didn't even know why I wanted to have a podcast. I didn't have a YouTube channel. I didn't have nothing. And I feel like right now, I've done more than certain journalists who have gone and studied. Absolutely. So I feel like this is a call to people who think that they, I mean, education is very important. But at the same time, building a business around what you love can also help you. Absolutely, and this is the this is the media of the future. I mean. The legacy media is just basically completely hollowed out. Yeah, uh, this is you know this is the way that people are going to interact with with what's happening in the world, interact with the news agenda of the future. So well done for you know being a pioneer. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go, I have like one or two more questions. I want to ask you: You are a mayor and you are in politics right now. Yes. But there's a lot of people, and you went to university, of course. But there's a lot of um, politicians we've heard of, like Mr. Jacob Zuma who has um, not finished school, yeah. but still been able to get into power and still been able to get into politics. So for someone who might not have finished school or someone who doesn't understand the criteria 
of how to get into politics? Like, is there any specific criteria or is there anyone that's willing to get into the public sector and work their way up or get into politics and work their way up? Mm. Okay, so in politics, remember the, the, this is a democracy. It's an open democracy. Everyone can vote and that means everyone can stand for office. Everyone who is a South African citizen yeah. can stand for election. There are no other requirements. Obviously, you, you, you're not allowed to uh, have a criminal record. You're not allowed to be a, 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 you can't be going through bankruptcy. Yeah. But there's a few small things. But basically, anyone who is a South African citizen can stand for office. There's no education requirement. Uh, and that's an important mm -hmm. feature of a democracy. You don't want to say ever in a democracy anywhere that power is reserved only for those who can afford to go to university or have had the privilege of, of, uh, you know, of further education. Yeah. It must be open to anyone. So that's, that's established. If you want to run for office, you can do that. If you want to work in the public sector, as in work for the government, in a, in a department, in, a, uh, in a, a role that actually makes policy or, uh, or delivers projects, yeah. in almost all of those jobs, there is a requirement for, a, at the very least, a metric for if you want to be a, a metro police officer, for example, yes. or a law enforcement officer, mm -hmm. a fireman. Uh, and those are good jobs, by the way. Yeah. Let me tell you, those are great jobs. And there's always lots of vacancies there. So I really encourage people who are watching this, if, you have a, if you've ever been interested in a career in law enforcement or emergency services, please check that out. There's no requirement there for, for, uh, for university. Uh, if you want to be, obviously, in, in any of the engineering fields, in water, electricity, in, yes. in sanitation, then you need to, you need to go to varsity. Um, and and this, this wonderful career path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, I want to understand this for myself. Um, elections happens every four years. Five years in South Africa. Five years in South Africa. Yeah. So does the mayor also stay the mayor for that term That's and right. they switch again or can you be voted into power again so you can have two terms, three terms? You can have two in South Africa. Our constitution limits us to two terms, which is a good thing for mm -hmm. democracy. You never want to have a situation as you have, unfortunately, in many African countries to the yeah. north of us where people stay in office for 30, 40 years and they just never, you can't get rid of them. We are limited to two terms only. Two terms of five years, and then you must leave. Oh, but but the but the the government the the part if the party wins, they will still have someone within their party. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes of yes. course. And lastly, before we go, before you can ask me questions about myself, I want to ask you: Are you looking forward to twenty twenty four elections? Oh, I am. Yeah, I am. Look, I, I'm. You've got mainly kind of Gen Z viewers, right? Mm -hmm. So none of them were uh, were alive in nineteen ninety four. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, that's definitely right. <laughs> but let me tell you, 1994 was obviously a turning point for our country. We, we uh, became a democracy. This election, 2024, exactly 30 years later, is the most important election we have had since then. Wow. Because for the first time, when I was growing up, yes. EB, one party had a massive majority, 70% mm -hmm. of the vote nationally. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. For the first time in my life, yeah. that uh, in a d democratic election, we face the possibility of a change in government. Wow. That is very exciting. Yeah, so I cannot wait for 2020, uh, 2024. If we get it right, it's going to require people to show up to vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I really want to just encourage everyone. This is this is make or break for our country. It, things are. Let's be honest with one another, Ibi. Things are not going well in South yeah, Africa. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, they are not going well in South Africa. I don't want to. I don't want to get into all of the reasons why, because all, we all understand the reasons mm -hmm. why. But it, all of us, I think, know deep down that it could be going so much better for our country. Definitely. This is an awesome place. Yeah, it can work. We can make a success of this. But we are going to have to have better leadership. Yeah, and uh, I do. So please, please do participate. And I do think like South Africa is one of the countries where people have the greatest things to say, but also the most negative things to say about the country. Like people yeah. looking out, where that's about how beautiful the country is, how friendly the people are, but also about the crime that they face in the country. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why we need to vote and obviously uh, sway the positives to the forefront and not allow the negatives to overcome us. But before we go, Mr. Mayor, 
Yeah. I want to know if you want to know anything about myself. So tell me how you how you got started in this um, in this podcast in this YouTube show and and how you've managed to get it to grow. I mean, the, it's a competitive space. There's yes. thousands of uh, of of YouTubers. How do you rise to the top? For me personally, uh, when I left school, like I said, I don't I wanted to be a podcast. I had no knowledge of podcasts. Move from there to one day in 2019. One of my friends said, yo, EB, let's go film a YouTube video. I had no idea what YouTube, I knew I knew what YouTube was, but I had no idea how it worked, mm. how to get started. Went to UCT, we filmed the video there. Maybe I might have encountered you there, but you were done at that time, 2019. I was long done. Long. Yeah, you were long done, yeah? So from there, I filmed the video, the public interviews. And it's crazy to think from that moment to now sit down with a political figure. It shows the amount of growth that I've, yeah. um, that I've went through. But his mom didn't know that he went to UCT at that day. So he used his mom car. He had no license at the time. I don't know why I'm telling you this, <laughs> but he had no license at the time. So his mom didn't want him to drive far. Yeah. So we go there, we filmed the video, went back home. We thought it was scot free. But on the way there, we sw- stopped at a Claremont um, engine and he swiped his card. But his mom had his card, her card, his, his SMSs yes. on her phone. So she found out that it we was we busted. So from there, I recorded videos at UWC, UCT, Stellenbosch. And people became very fond of my interviews on Clifton because people would say, like, Cape Town would say the most outrageous things. Oh, really? And the shock value was very important because people like <laughs> yes, things yes. that they don't expect. Yeah. So from there, I gained a bit of buzz. I used TikTok as a good tool because I feel like as a creative, if you want to grow, TikTok is probably the most relative to use to, to, um, relative tool to use right now because it helps you. Yeah. It, it allows you, the algorithm allows you to reach more people faster than Instagram or YouTube itself. Okay. And um, from there, I've just went from strength to strength to now having a podcast. And my main philosophy is to try so many things that when I leave one day, people are going to be like, yo, Eb already done that. Uh, I'm nice. trying to leave. I'm trying to leave nothing for that. people to nice try. So, stone unturned. yeah. So the podcast for me was something that the beginning of the year I never thought about. But in February, myself and Louis over there started the podcast, and now we're sitting with the mayor. So I think we've done wow. pretty well. You have done well, man. And and uh, I I've also tried to focus my attention on on uh, on TikTok. I'm I think I'm the only I'm still the only South African mayor on on TikTok. Wow. So please. Uh, Follow, follow me, man. Are you gonna follow me? <laughs> yeah, I want to follow. I follow you on Instagram. Okay. I was watching your interview in okay. the streets because okay. I feel like okay. everyone that was that had the youth speaking. They were they were talking about that one. Oh, like, oh, oh the geez. mayor's fun. He's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the. I think the our biggest challenge in 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 politics is to connect with with um, Gen Z. Uh, Gen, Gen Z. Z. The, it's it is the I think the most the the generation that is most uh, kind of disconnected from the political process. Mm-hmm. So my, my final question is why do you think that is and 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 how can we do better? I think it goes back to what I think is displayed on television what politicians are because people are so afraid first and foremost of their friends having backlash because if you mention now if I mention I have a politician like I said I'm going to get so much negative backlash. I feel like this really? is negative order like on politicians because of the corruption, because of the load shedding, because of unemployment, because of the theft, people always look at politics as something negative. So personally, I feel like you seem like the right person to be in power in Cape Town. And I feel like as as we get more of the right leaders in place and as we get more of the right people doing the right things, I feel like the youth will follow suit and they will just go along with it. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much, man. Uh, it's been such a fun uh, conversation, and, mm-hmm. and congratulations to to what you've achieved. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for having me. So, guys, that has been the Kid Show with Mr. Jordan here, Lewis. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, follow him on TikTok, wait, follow wait, him wait. on Instagram. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Because my daughter, who's seven, yeah. is obviously heavy into YouTube. All she watches is YouTube, and she watches these programs where people unwrap uh presents and toys have yeah. you seen those unboxings unboxings yeah. yeah i don't know what is entertaining about that do you do unboxings if you <laughs> sometimes when a, when a brand sends me a product but that's, <laughs> but that's about it not on a regular my daughter watch hours of unboxing and then she st- now she started to do her own youtube videos yeah uh, i'm not going to give you her channel name <laughs> but um but she always says hit hit the is it the little bell what hit is the it? notification bell hit the bell and and uh, <laughs> and subscribe. I think that's what she said. Yeah, I mean, hit the bell, like. So I'm going to say it for you now, everyone. Hit the bell and subscribe and share this video. Love. Take care, guys. <laughs> Perfect. That's it.